It's been 48 hours since anyone has heard from Stacy, Susie, or Cheryl. You've got these three ladies that just up and vanished and nobody knows why. Everything in the house appeared normal. But they're not there. There's no sign of them anywhere. There was no doubt that something was amiss. I kept wondering when she's going to come through the door, and she never did. With each passing hour, they're less likely to find the women alive. My heart just sunk. It was horrible. Maybe they're not coming back. Because bad things do happen. This is the kind of case detectives lose sleep over. Three women disappear from a residence in the middle of the night, without a trace. Countless tips and leads create an elaborate web of possibilities to one of Missouri's most haunting mysteries. In June of 1992, in Springfield, Missouri, school is almost out for summer, and teenagers throughout the Ozarks are already in vacation mode. Cruising Carney was a really big deal, um, the main drag, and everybody got in their car with their friends and drove up and down the street and hung out. That's what kids do in the Midwest, and that's, that's what we did. It's an especially exciting moment for high school classmates Susie Streeter and Stacy McCall. They're both seniors at Kickapoo High School in Springfield and are about to graduate. I'm Janice McCall, Stacy McCall's mother. Susie and Stacy met when they were in about the second grade, and they went to the same schools together. I'm Stuart McCall. I'm Stacy McCall's father. Stacy was my youngest daughter, and she was 18 in 1992. She was a good student. She was very kind. One of our friends had a bridal shop, and she would model bridal dresses. There it is. There's that smile, and here we go. And she enjoyed that. By contrast, Susie has an edge. She's artsy. She dates the bad boy types, even though she herself isn't known to cause any trouble. She spends most of her time at the local movie theater, where she works throughout high school. I'm Nigel Holderby, and I'm Susie Streeter's best friend. Susie had the most amazing personality. She just was one of those girls that was super friendly, outgoing, um, very strong. And I was just drawn to her because she was a very outspoken individual. I'm Deborah Schwartz, Susie Streeter's my niece. Susie was a sweetie. She really was. She was a fun kid. My daughter and her we were just six weeks apart, and they were very close. It's graduation day, and Stacy and Susie are beaming because they're about to get their diplomas. Their families are proud to see Susie and Stacy across the stage. Stacy Kathleen McCall. Susie's mom, Cheryl, is also on the sidelines. She's very proud of her only daughter. Susie was excited about moving on and graduating and um, what what the future holds. She wanted to go to cosmetology school. She talked about going into hair and following in her mom's footsteps. She talked about that a lot. After graduation, my boyfriend and I picked up this small cake and took it to her house. It was shaped like a dragon. Susie had a thing for dragons. It was actually a dinosaur. It was the closest that I could get. As the evening wears on, graduation after parties are heating up around town. Susie and Stacy were planning on going to an after party. They were going to spend some time with their high school friends at night. 
The plan is for everyone to go to the amusement park called Whitewater the following day in Branson, about 45 miles south of Springfield. Whitewater was the hot spot for summer. So Susie was gonna call me first thing the next morning and we were going to Branson. After a night of party hopping, Susie and Stacy call it a night and decide to stay over at a friend's house. Stacy called me and said, Mom, I'm gonna stay at Janelle's. So I said, all right, that's fine. But they arrived to find it's a full house. There were too much family at Janelle's house. So Stacy and Susie decided to go stay at Susie's house. About 2 a.m., they left Janelle's house. They promised Janelle that they would go to Whitewater in the morning and that they would meet with her and have a great time. The next morning, Janelle is excited to hit the road for the water park. About 7.30 a.m., Janelle called Susie's house, got no answer, uh, left a message. Janelle keeps waiting for Stacy and Susie to call, but doesn't hear from them. By 12.30, she's a little concerned. So Janelle and her boyfriend go over to Susie's house to find out what's taking them so long. In the driveway, Janelle and Mike saw all three vehicles. Uh, Susie's and Stacy's were in the front driveway and the mom's was in the carport. Janelle and Mike get to the house and as they walk up the steps, they realize there's glass on the ground and that the glass around the globe light over the door has been shattered. Mike swept up the glass for Janelle because she was barefooted and he didn't want her to cut her feet. He just shook it out of the pan there alongside the fence line. The front door was unlocked, so they went inside. Inside the house, everything appears normal. There's no mess in the kitchen or in the living room. So Janelle and Mike decide to check the backyard. Stacy, Susie, and her mother, Cheryl, are not there. There's no sign of them anywhere. And Janelle and Mike are not quite sure what's happening. After waiting a few minutes for their friends to walk back in, Mike and Janelle decide to leave. As they're heading out the door, the phone rings. Just in case it's Susie or Stacy calling, Janelle picks up the phone. But it's not either of their friends. It was a obscene phone call. The individual would not identify himself. He just began making comments that were sexually explicit in nature. She listened to the person talk. Then she asked him, what? What'd you say? And the person said it again. They were using the F word and several other words. And she just hung the phone up. This call was jarring for Janelle, but she remembers Susie complaining about Frank calls before. She thinks it's just a bad joke from a classmate. Suddenly, the phone rings again. Janelle answered the second call, and there again, obscene phone call, click. It's over with. At that time, they decide that maybe they went to the amusement park with somebody else, so they leave. Across town, Stacy's parents are also surprised they haven't heard from their daughter. Stacy was very good about telling us where she was going to be. She had told me she would call me when she got up, but she hadn't called to let me know she was going yet to Branson. I decided to call Janelle's house, and I talked to her younger sister, 
And she says, Stacy's not here. And I said, what do you mean she's not there? She said, Susie and Stacy decided at the last minute, about two o'clock, that they were going to go on to Susie's. Thinking Stacy and Susie are likely en route to Branson, Janice keeps her cool until seven more hours pass without a word. I have friends that had people working at the water park, and I called to see if they'd gone down there and if they had been there, and they had not. And then at about 5.30, I was getting very concerned, and I decided, okay, I'll just go over there. I get to Cheryl's house, I see the cars in the driveway, and then I thought, well, she's here. At that same time, Janelle and her boyfriend, Mike, decide to go back to Susie's house again and see if they're there. We went inside and in the bedroom. I became concerned because she did not take her purse with her driver's license or anything. She did not take her makeup bag. Not only is Stacy's purse there, but Cheryl and Susie's purses are there too, all lined up in a row. Janice thinks it's strange that Cheryl's purse is in Susie's room and not in her own room. Immediately, Janice noticed something else that doesn't sit right. I saw her shorts, and they were folded up nicely. And everything was put nicely on her shoes. Those were the clothes she last saw Stacy wearing, the only clothes she left the house with the night before. I thought, why did she do this? Why would she go somewhere and leave her stuff? Why didn't she call me? Where is she? It's the day after high school graduation in June of 1992, and Janice McCall is frantically looking for her 18-year-old daughter, Stacy McCall, along with her classmate, Susie Streeter, and Susie's mother, Cheryl Levert. I called my husband and I said, Stu, they're missing and I can't find them. And I've called everywhere I can. He says, yeah. He said, uh, I'll be right there. And I said, I'm gonna call the police while you come. I had a gut feel that something might be wrong, but I, I, I was in denial, I think. This is every parent's worst nightmare. It's been over 12 hours, and Janice has no answers. I'm Rick Bookout. I'm a retired Springfield police officer with the Springfield, Missouri Police Department. I was assigned the call at 1717 East Del Mar on June the 7th, 1992. When I arrived, uh, the first thing I noticed, there were several people uh, in the yard. Uh, the door was open. People were coming and going from inside the house. Mrs. McCall told me that uh, her daughter, Stacy wasn't there, um, and that a lot of her friends were concerned because they couldn't find Susie or her mother, Mrs. Levin. Officer Bookout does a walkthrough, writing down everything he sees. Everything in the house appeared normal. Nothing seemed to be ransacked. I didn't notice anything that would indicate any kind of a struggle. Susie's bedroom looked like it had been slept in. There were clothes, garments that both girls had worn on the dresser. They had taken their makeup off. You could see that it had been scrubbed off as they prepared to go to bed. Their jewelry was there. The keys were there and purses, all three purses. So they knew they had been there. When I looked in the purses, everything appeared to be there. In fact, Mrs. Levitt had money in her purse. Uh, I didn't really find anything that, that caused concern uh, until I found Mrs. Levitt's cigarettes and lighter. Cheryl smoked almost one after another. She was really a chain smoker. She never went out of the house without her cigarettes. 
I didn't see any signs of foul play. Now, I don't think they left there willingly because three women are going to just walk out of the house leaving things that are important to them and personal things behind. With more questions than answers, Officer Bookout writes up a missing persons report for Cheryl, Susie and Stacy. I spent the whole night on the couch. Janice went to bed. I said, I'll, I'll spend the night up in case Stacy comes home. Uh, I don't remember her sleeping hardly at all. Uh, I kept wondering when she's going to come through the door. And she never did. By the following morning, police hit the ground running and the case is assigned to Detective David Asher. I'm David Asher former detective sergeant with the Springfield Police Department. This case was very suspicious to me. From the crime scene, from the cars, from the keys, to the clothes, to the cigarettes, to the jewelry, there was no doubt that something was amiss. After detectives take over, they quickly realize their investigation is already at an extreme disadvantage. At least 10 people have been in and out of Cheryl and Susie's home during the first day. It's really difficult to deal with an adulterated crime scene. Things have been moved and cleaned up by the people that were there. I was concerned that it just complicated the case tremendously. By now, the house is cordoned off and crime scene investigators are finally processing the scene. The crime lab worked extensively trying to collect evidence as best they could. Glass was picked up. They collected everything they could find. They fingerprinted everything. Considering the lack of evidence of a struggle in the house, detectives begin to theorize what happened between 2.30 when they left Chanel's house and 8 o'clock in the morning when friends and family started calling and getting no answer. Detectives come up with two plausible scenarios. Someone had taken them from the house. Um, it must have either done so through multiple perpetrators, weapons, or it was somebody they knew and they fell victim to some sort of ruse. Somebody came to the door whether they knew them or not, and there was some reason that they needed to leave the house or were threatened to leave the house, and they walked out on their own with just the clothes that they were wearing. Detective Asher quickly assembles a task force to fan out and interview a number of the individuals, starting with the families of the missing women. They also begin to zero in on Susie's mum, Cheryl, wondering if there's anyone in her life who could be responsible for the disappearances. My sister um, was a unique person. She is one of those people you would forget. She was pretty intense, passionate, one of the most responsible people I'd ever known. Cheryl had no enemies that I know of. She was smart and savvy, and um, the only way that anybody would get the best of her would be to hold a gun to her child's head. Cheryl had recently gotten divorced from Susie's stepfather. She had bought a new home, and they were restarting their life. She seemed to be just really enjoying being independent on her own and focused on Susie. Investigators look into the only clues so far, the obscene phone caller who called the liver house numerous times. Janelle said it was a male caller. Uh, she thought the caller was, in her words, teenish. But she didn't recognize the voice at all. Technology wasn't the best then. Uh, we were at the mercy of the telephone company and the phone company couldn't figure out where it came from. Janelle regretted that she hung up, didn't try to talk to him, 
to increase the opportunity to trace that call later or figure out who it is. At this point, it's been 48 hours since anyone has heard from Stacy, Susie, or Cheryl. The community is definitely on edge, wondering where they could be. Overnight, you saw Springfield going from a town that left their doors unlocked and felt safe. All of a sudden, you've got these three ladies that just up and vanished and nobody knows why. People don't just disappear and you don't know where they are. They come back. And then there comes a place in time where you have this very real, terrifying moment when you think, you know, maybe they're not coming back. Because bad things do happen. Restless, family and friends band together to get Susie, Cheryl, and Stacy's face out there. We handed out flyers. Uh, We went to several places, several businesses, grocery stores, and asked them if we could put it up in their window. We'd make enough if if you'd even be willing to stuff them in the sacks or something, if somebody would do that. What do you mean? You'd do that for us? The media quickly catches on, and the story airs on television sets throughout several counties. And before long, the missing trio is dubbed the Springfield Three. We were overloaded with publicity, and what went from possible 500 leads to 5,000 leads within days. As the task force follows up on every lead, detectives discover someone suspicious in Cheryl and Susie's family. Police learn that Cheryl has an older son by the name of Bart Streeter. Bart Streeter is Susie's brother and nine years older than his sister. Bart Streeter is seen by most of the family as a black sheep. He's an alcoholic and he has a turbulent relationship with his mum and sister. In fact, things had escalated pretty badly after a recent falling out. Bart was disinherited by his mom and Susie. See, he was afraid Art was going to hurt her because of his violent temper. I know he's my nephew, but I don't have a great deal of respect for him. Would he be able to do something like this? Maybe in a fit of rage and passion? Bart Streeter, the son of Cheryl and older brother to Susie. Bart was struggling with alcohol addiction from the time that he left his mom's house when he was approximately 17 years old. He hung around with lowlifes in my experience with him. He has behaved bizarrely sometimes. Cheryl knew he could be violent because he punched on her before. There was quite a conflict there. And he was drinking so much that she couldn't deal with him. She was pretty adamant. I don't want you involved in our lives at all. Stay away. For a few years, Bart keeps his distance and lives in another state until a rough breakup leads him back to Springfield. He wanted to try and regenerate a relationship with his mom and sister that he hadn't had in several years. He ended up getting a job at a survey company and uh, was making pretty good money and he was pretty content with that. When Bart came back into their lives, Susie was very happy. Cheryl was a little skeptical. During her last year of high school, Susie turns 18 and decides to move in with her brother four miles away. I don't think Cheryl wanted her to move in with Bart, but she felt like she needs to know who her brother is and hopefully her brother's going to show his best side. But then they had a fight. Bart wouldn't turn down the stereo, and Bart was exceedingly drunk. Susie reached around him to turn the stereo down, and he didn't want her to do that. He shoved Susie, and he got violently angry. (laughs) 
She had a bruise. You could see that something had happened, that he had hit her. They were no longer on speaking terms after that. And that was the last of their relationship. Suspicious of his whereabouts on the night of June 6, detectives bring Bart in for formal questioning. First, he appeared concerned. He said it was at a neighbor's house. He indicated that they were watching TV and drinking. And that information was verified by the neighbor. According to the man whose house he was at, Bart got sloshed. That was the word he used in his statement. Bart said he decided that he'd go home somewhere around 11.30, 12 o'clock. And then he said he fell asleep and didn't go anywhere. But there are no witnesses that could say that Bart slept at his own home that night. So we asked him to take a polygraph. Bart did take a polygraph. That polygraph showed that he was being truthful. The problem I had with that is when you're an alcoholic and uh, when you have a violent temper, you're going to forget the things you do. Because they have no direct evidence to connect Bart to the women's disappearance, Bart goes on the back burner of the investigation, while police continue to follow up on other leads. Authorities expand their search to all over the surrounding area. They're operating under intense pressure that with each passing hour, they're less likely to find the women alive. Neighbors, even strangers, turned out to help police search areas all over. From Lake Springfield to Forsyth, to Joplin, to Stockton. We actually drug Lake Springfield looking for bodies looking for maybe something from the crime scene. We used helicopters all over southwest Missouri. We used police dogs. We used uh, cadaver dogs. We tried everything we knew to do. Day after day, the countless searches are fruitless, leaving the families of these women in a constant state of unrest. My heart just sunk. It was horrible. I was a mess. I had nightmares. I had a lot of dreams about my sister. I dreamt about her driving alongside me in a car and just waving at me. I'm okay. I'm okay. I felt like she was trying to communicate with me. And that was so frustrating because I really felt like she was. And, and I, I wasn't getting it. As police continue to investigate those close to the women, detectives discover Susie's brother isn't the only one in her life who piques their interest. Dustin Rackla was Susie Streeter's ex-boyfriend. Dustin worked at the theater with us. He um, was just a normal guy, uh, attractive, you know, just really funny. So they had a good relationship. They got along really well uh, until they didn't. Dustin Reckla and his friend Michael Clay were involved in a mausoleum break-in where they took the corpse that were in the mausoleum to steal the teeth out of their head. And Susie Streeter's car was used in the commission of the crime. And so Susie was brought in for questioning. She cooperated with the police and told them what she knew that Clay and Reckler were responsible for the uh, desecration. And Susie was scheduled to testify against Michael Clay and Dusty Reckler in court. Clay and Reckler were upset with her for the fact that, that she was cooperating with the police. It would be a likely situation that Dusty and Mike would seek revenge against the women. As soon as police become aware of this, they do not waste any time getting Dustin and Michael into the department for questioning. Michael Clay was angry during the interview. Mike said, I wish those bitches were dead. Makes the hair stand on the back of my neck. 
this is absolutely the potential suspect. Several weeks into the investigation of the Springfield Three, police identified two suspects, Susie's ex-boyfriend Dustin and his friend Michael. Before Susie went missing, she was scheduled to testify against Michael and Dustin in court. These guys had potential reasoning to want to hurt her, get rid of her, stop her from testifying against them in court. But Dustin Reckla stated he was in a car, passed out at Robertson in commercial from drinking too much the night they disappeared. No witnesses, we were unable to verify his alibi, Michael Clay, nobody knew where he was. Physical evidence will be the only thing that can really prove whether or not Michael and Dustin are involved. Police take their fingerprints and compare them to everything found at Susie and Cheryl's house. We didn't find any fingerprints or evidence at the house of Dustin or Michael Clay. Both Michael and Dustin also agreed to take polygraph tests, and they pass. With no physical evidence tying Dustin and Michael to the crime, police are forced to let them go. Dustin was actually a really good guy. He was just in with the wrong crowd. Within months, the investigation takes a drastic turn when someone calls in with a chilling story that they believe could lead to the person responsible for the disappearance of the Springfield Three. They were alerting us that there was a potential killer in Springfield, Missouri at the time of their disappearance. The tipster tells police to look into this guy, Robert Cox, who had been convicted of kidnapping and assault with a deadly weapon. On top of that, he is also the prime suspect in the 1976 murder of a woman named Sharon Zellers. Sharon Zellers was a teenager who was abducted in Florida on her way home from Disney, where she worked. Cox was staying at a hotel near Disney World with his parents. On the night Sharon Zellers went missing, he returned to his hotel, injured pretty badly. The injury to Cox had to do with his tongue being lacerated, uh, almost bitten off. Coincidentally, after Cox was taken to the hospital, they found Sharon nearby the motel room, deceased. Sharon's corpse was by a sewage facility, only 100 feet from Cox's hotel room. But after being arrested, Cox is let go because of insufficient evidence tying him to the murder. Years later, in 1992, Robert Cox moved to Springfield, Missouri. The Zellers' parents felt it was imperative to keep track of Cox. They felt like he would do it again, that potentially he was a serial killer. Authorities immediately begin looking into Cox as a potential suspect. As they dig into his work history, they realize there's an eerie connection between Robert Cox and the missing women. Robert Cox worked for a telephone company and they were surveying their underground wiring in front of Cheryl and Susie's house. And there's another eerie connection. Cox was previously employed at the same car dealership as Stacy's father. He was a used truck salesman and he worked in a department next to me. I didn't know him at the time. I don't remember seeing him at the dealership, but there were times when Stacy did bring meals to me at work where he would have seen her. Please track down Robert Cox for an interview where he immediately denies having anything to do with the Springfield Three. He claims the night Susie, Stacy, and Cheryl disappeared, he went to a golf tournament and stayed with his parents. The next morning, he took his girlfriend to church. 
To verify Robert Cox's alibi, we interviewed his girlfriend. She verified that he spent the night with his parents. And the next morning, they had gone to Central Assembly of God Church. Cox seems to have an alibi, and there's just not enough evidence to keep pursuing him. We just didn't have anything that would place him at the crime scene. I think it's a coincidence that Robert Cox and I worked in the same place. It may not have been, but that's what I think. Three years later, in 1995, Cox comes back on police's radar when he's arrested in Decatur, Texas, for holding an armed weapon on a 12-year-old girl. He goes to prison and begins serving a life sentence for aggravated robbery. When Robert Cox committed the crime in Texas, that regenerated investigators to believe that maybe he really was involved in this situation in Springfield and responsible for their disappearance, so they sent investigators to interview him. Suddenly, his story changes. He doesn't admit to being involved, but he doesn't deny it either. He simply won't talk. Police then re-interview his girlfriend, and her story is drastically different this time around. His former girlfriend uh, said she had no idea where Robert Cox was the night the women disappeared. And they didn't go to church the next day. Police look for clues to tie Cox to the missing women. Then astonishingly, four years after the women went missing, he breaks his silence when a local TV reporter interviews him in prison. The mystery of the Springfield Three has haunted the nation for years. Then astonishingly, Robert Cox breaks his silence. I know that they're dead. I'll say that. I know that. That's not a theory. Yeah, but I know that it's just, I just know that they're dead. That's not my theory, I just know that. There's no doubt about that. The interview sends shockwaves all the way back to Springfield. Law enforcement immediately interviews Cox, hoping for a confession. He wouldn't admit he was responsible, but in the conversation he said, I just know they're dead. I just know it. And uh, when my mom dies, I'll tell you, but not until then. He didn't want to embarrass his mother. We've seen over the years that you do have people that want the attention for whatever reason. So it's hard to gauge whether or not he's just trying to play with law enforcement and the media or if he truly knows something. Robert Cox doesn't speak out again, only adding to the amount of unanswered questions that are keeping countless people up at night. Time goes by, a year goes by, two years go by. You always think that something's going to happen. After five years of rigorous investigation, the Springfield Police announced that they can no longer justify the manpower or the money to continue working the case, even on a part-time basis. I felt very upset. I felt like they were giving up on finding my daughter, and I didn't want anyone to give up. I didn't like it, but I understood it. But what do you do when you don't have DNA, when you have no fingerprints, when you have absolutely no evidence and you have no bodies? Where do you start? I don't know where you start. Over the next 17 years, the case is cold, but not forgotten. We continue to look into all the tips that they receive, but not actively working at the case. It's still classified as an open case. Everybody that we interviewed, none of them have necessarily been ruled out as a potential person of interest. We pray for the resolution to this case all the time. Has it affected me and my family? Yes, it has. <clears throat> but I know beyond a shadow of a doubt, this case will be resolved and the people responsible or person prosecuted appropriately and the family be able to put an end to all of this 
torture they've been going through all this time. I think as human beings, we have a tendency to try to solve a mystery and to make sense of it. And I think that at some point, somebody will crack. There's a secret that somebody has and that somebody knows. In June 1997, a bench was dedicated to Cheryl, Susie and Stacy inside the victim's memorial garden in Springfield's Phelps Grove Park. Every year for the last 27 years, just I think about it, but there's no closure. I've accepted that I won't know in my lifetime. Cheryl was my big sister and she always took care of me and looked out for me, and I miss that. Memories are weird, and that day that's captured in this moment that was happy, that was excited, that was looking forward to the future. I have to realize that either she's 45 here on earth, or she's still 18 in heaven. And that's, that's a real hard thing to do, you know, and I don't want her to be dead. I want her to be alive.